Good morning, everyone. How are you all? My name is Teresa Dillon Lundgren. Hi, and I'm Terry Brody. And we're going to talk about the Holy Spirit. Who is the Holy Spirit? He is truly the breath of God. He is the third person of the Holy Trinity, often the forgotten person of the Holy Trinity. He is equal in dignity and majesty with the Father and the Son. The Holy Spirit is one we can have a relationship with and we can know and love him, just as we know and love God the Father and God the Son. The Holy Spirit has an intellect and will and freely knows and loves. The Holy Spirit's will is in perfect alignment with the Father and the Son. He comes from the love between the Father and the Son. He is the truth bearer and the comforter and counselor. Jesus said he would send the advocate. The Holy Spirit is one of the three persons of God with the Father and the Son. And that is in our creed at Mass. Come substantial with the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. That means of the same substance. The Holy Spirit has been active with the Father and the Son for all eternity. And we came to a fuller understanding of him after Jesus' ascension into heaven. This is a time that the Holy Spirit is very active with us and is active in all lives that follow Jesus and seek the will of the Father. At baptism, we receive grace. Water signifies the Holy Spirit. It is poured on us and cleanses us. And the Holy Spirit is given, through, given to us through baptism and we become adopted children of the Father. We are made one with Jesus and we are filled with the Holy Spirit to live out our new Christian life. And we are called as sons and daughters of God. The Holy Spirit's role is to enkindle within us the grace in order to know Jesus, and to know the Father. Everyone who is alive in Christ has grace, and everyone follows the will of the Father. The Holy Spirit makes this happen. The Holy Spirit is in the scriptures, in the tradition, in the magisterium, which he assists in the sacramental liturgy, through its words and symbols, in which the Holy Spirit puts us in communion with Christ. In prayer is where he intercedes for us. In the charisms and ministries by which the church is built up. In the signs of apostolic and missionary life. In the witness of saints through whom he manifests his holiness and continues the work of salvation. Jesus established the church and when he died and went to heaven, he had the advocate come to us, the Holy Spirit. Our liturgy, the Mass, is the most powerful work of the Holy Spirit. In the most holy Eucharist, God, the Trinity, comes to meet us, to descend to us, and we encounter him. This is all done by the action of the Holy Spirit, alive in the Church. You can say it is a joint action of the Church and the Holy Spirit, and this mutual action brings forth the real presence of Christ, our Lord. The Holy Spirit speaks and acts, using assigned words in the Mass, extending his hands over the bread and wine while speaking the words of consecration. It is this action that guarantees the working of the Holy Spirit to make present the Savior of the world in a real and true sacramental way. <clears throat> Saint Louis de Montfort states that Mary is the actual spouse of the Holy Spirit. Together with the Holy Spirit, Mary produced the greatest thing that ever was or ever will be, God, man, Jesus. When the Holy Spirit, her spouse, finds Mary in a soul, he hastens there and enters fully into it. He gives himself generously to that soul according to the place it has given to his spouse. 
the Holy Spirit is present in the sacraments. It happens in confession. When we ask for forgiveness of our sins, the Holy Spirit overshadows and cleanses us. In confirmation, we are filled with the Holy Spirit and confirming our faith in the Catholic Church and in Christ. The Holy Spirit is in the holy orders, in marriage, in extreme unction. This all happens. In prayer, we don't even know how to pray, but it is the Holy Spirit that intercedes for us through groanings and moanings of our heart. Let's talk about the history of the Holy Spirit, the beginning of the church. Pentecost, what happened? That's in Acts 2, verses 1 through 4. They were filled, the hearts, of the hundred believers. These believers were the first of the New Testament. Jesus said, I have to go so the Comforter can come to experience the fullness of God's plan, which was accomplished through Jesus Christ. Pentecost means the anointing of the head and heart, infilling of the Holy Spirit with tongues of fire, Acts 2, 4, were the apostles, blessed mother, men and women, and laymen, who were together in one place in the upper room. Suddenly there came from heaven a sound like a mighty rushing wind, and it filled the entire house where they were sitting, and divided tongues of fire appeared to them and rested on each one of them. All of them were filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other tongues. God-fearing Jews were staying in Jerusalem at this time and every nation. When they heard this sound and came to see what it was in bewilderment, because when the apostles were talking, they heard their own language being spoken. How can this be as these are Galileans? And they said, they must be drunk. <laughs> And Peter spoke up and said, it's only 9 a.m. in the morning. Peter went on to say, Jesus, whom you crucified, is both God and Messiah. He still lives. When the, when the people heard this, they were cut to the heart and said, what shall we do? And Peter said, repent and be baptized, and each and every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for forgiveness of your sins, and you shall receive the Holy Spirit. There were 3,000 baptized that day, and more were added as the word spread. Without the baptism and infilling of the Holy Spirit, the apostles would be, have lacked the power to evangelize the world, and Christianity wouldn't be. They all started meeting in the temple courts and they began breaking bread and wine and praising God and enjoying each other and selling their property for the good of the group. When your children are baptized, they receive the Holy Spirit as the parents were also. Without baptism, salvation is not possible and that gift is the Holy Spirit. Let's look at how the Holy Spirit works in the Catholic Church. The Holy Spirit gives charisms. Charisms is a spiritual gift given for the good of the church. It is sort of a spiritual quality or ability to offer some service to the church. The Holy Spirit is the sanctifier who was sent by the Father and the Son to complete the work of the Son. In the liturgy, the Holy Spirit is the teacher of the faith of the people of God. The desire and work of the Spirit in the heart of the church. The role of the Holy Spirit is to bring the interpretation of God's word to the people, we the church. Giving an example, the Pope is trying to figure out the church's position on a certain subject. He prays to the Holy Spirit to bring the Father and Son's word. The Holy Spirit is in perfect alignment between the Father and the Son. The Holy Spirit has guided the Catholic Church since the beginning of our Catholic Church, since Pentecost in the upper room. And just to bring it to a personal note with all of you, 
um, we, as I'm sure so many of you have, have had uh, ongoing miracles and testimonies about the working of the Holy Spirit in our own lives. And I can't think about the Holy Spirit without uh, thinking of my mom's dad, uh, Warren Boyle, who you see up here. He was a wild, passionate Irishman. And uh, the reason I say that my grandpa always comes to mind when I mention the Holy Spirit is that my grandpa, like many people, um, a beautiful person, but did struggle with the addiction of alcoholism for the majority of his life. And when he was probably around, I don't know, in his late 50s, he was on a, you know, a binge from drinking and was in church. And actually, this happened on Holy Thursday. And he was crying out to God, please, please, God, please deliver me from this, this terrible curse of alcoholism. Well, Grandpa always said that he heard very audibly God speak to him and said, Warren, from this day forward, you will never have another cigarette again. Well, my grandpa, being the colorful man that he was, uh, shouted real loudly, what in the heck does cigarettes have to do with anything? And so he left the church that night, you know, feeling a bit despairing, like, what in the world? I asked for deliverance from alcoholism. Well, about a year later, my grandpa uh, was on another terrible binge from drinking and wound up in the hospital. And this time, he actually ended up dying and was declared dead. And my grandpa said that he truly believes and knows that he went to hell. But God, in his mercy, uh, you know, allowed him to come back. And my grandpa, this sounds a little controversial, but this is truly a work of the Holy Spirit that when he came back, he woke up in that hospital bed speaking in tongues, even though he'd never spoken in tongues before. And from that moment on, he was actually healed and delivered from alcoholism. And I know my mom has another miraculous story with the Holy Spirit. Yeah, I'm gonna tell you about the story of, of my mother and my aunt and my uncle it's eight and my dad. Um, because of my dad's drinking, my uncle and my aunt were not talking to my dad for about five years. They just quit talking to him, period. They still communicated with my mom and us kids, but not him. Well, we went down to grandma's house in Farmington, New Mexico, and spent the day with grandma, and then we were all driving home at night. We got to the state line between New Mexico and Colorado, and a drunk driver hit us head on. We were all really shook up and, uh, you know, we fell forward in the seats, etc. But nobody was terribly hurt. But my mom got out of the car and she ran to the state line office building there. And she was able to get a hold of my dad. So she called my dad and she said, go pick up Mary's husband and bring him out because our car is totally totaled and we can't drive it home. And so he, my dad went and picked up Mark and as they were driving out to come pick us up down at the county line, um, they must have had a wonderful talk because when they got there, they were laughing and joking with each other and they were relieved that none of us were hurt badly. We were all bummed up a little bit, but not bad. But from that day on, they always talked after that. And the interesting thing about that is it was the ninth day of the Holy Spirit Novena. And Dad had just finished saying the Novena when that occurred. So that was a miracle in itself. And now Terry's going to talk to you about her conversion. Well, like with my grandpa, uh, during my teen years, I kind of steered away from following the Lord. My mom had always raised us in a very strong Catholic home, and the Holy Spirit was always a big part of our lives. But uh, like a lot of teens do, I veered away, and I got married very young. I was married at the age of 19, and I moved to Santa Barbara, and uh, I was a travel agent at the time, and I had to go to Sabre training. And so I, as a new bride, I left uh, Santa Barbara and went to Dallas, Texas to do my saber training. And I was alone. And this was the first time I was away from my groom. I was away from my family for the first time. And it was, it was pretty harsh. It was a pretty rough time. And I remember being in the hotel and just feeling so homesick. I could barely stand it. And 
uh, really crying out to God and saying, God, I, I need to get closer to you again, and I need to, to come back. And I didn't really think too much of it um, after that, but then about three days later, I left from my trip from Dallas, and I was, uh, got on the plane to go, to, um, to go back to Santa Barbara, and got on the plane, and I don't know how to describe this in any other way. This uh, is hard to put into words, but while I was on the plane, I don't even really remember praying, but I just had this experience where the only way I can sort of describe it is that it was like somebody had taken a picture and poured into me this liquid love. And I realize that now that I was so overwhelmed with the Holy Spirit, and I was completely uh, like so emotionally char uh, emotional, and I started crying. And the poor guy next to me didn't know what to do with me. He was like, "Do I look at her? Do I not look at her?" Um, but the entire plane ride home, I couldn't quit crying, and I knew something had changed. I felt different physically, emotionally, spiritually, and all I can say is that. Uh, the person that got on the plane in Dallas was not the same person that got off the plane uh, when I got into Santa Barbara. And truly, by a work of miraculous work of the Holy Spirit, I have been forever changed and uh, have, have been really born again uh, because of the working of the Holy Spirit. And mom, you have a pretty neat story to tell as well. Yes, I was always a practicing Catholic. I never left the church. But in my early 20s, I started leaving the church in my mind. I was just going through the motions of going to mass and it was not very meaningful. The mass was boring, et cetera, et cetera. Well, I was up on a mountain and we were camping with my husband and I got a hold of a book called Prison to Praise by Merlin Carruthers. That book radically changed me and I absolutely fell in love with our Lord all over again. I was madly in love with our God. And the church came alive again, and the sacraments came alive again. And the Holy Spirit just kicked into me like a dynamo. And so now I'm going to let Terry talk about Grandpa and his pamphlets. We, my mom mentioned uh, a little bit ago about a novena uh, to the Holy Spirit. And with Grandpa, again, you can't think about Grandpa or the Holy Spirit um, without thinking of this novena. And my mom had mentioned this also was the one that her family had finished praying. But this particular novena is the most ancient of all of the novenas. And it is the only one that is actually approved by the church. And this novena was said to have been started really at Pentecost. And this novena, my grandpa had spent his whole life uh, passing these around to anybody and everybody that would listen. He would go to uh, Native American reservations um, where they struggle with alcoholism and he would distribute this novena. He'd meet people on the street and he would be uh, giving out this novena. And something pretty miraculous that my mom and I did was, um, uh, gosh, it's been about maybe two and a half years or three years ago, uh, we decided to start a Facebook group uh, called the Holy Spirit Novena in honor of this novena and really in honor of Grandpa. And we started this this group and uh, just, you know, didn't think too much of it. Started with 17 members. And I can just tell you that it's been an absolute miracle. We've taken our hands off and we have just watched the Holy Spirit uh, do his miraculous work. And we always laugh because we know that my grandpa is up in heaven continuing this ministry through this group where it's grown to uh, about 200,000 members now. And it has nothing to do with my mom and I. And it is just a witness and testimony to the power of this novena and just to the power of the Holy Spirit and what he'll do in all of our lives. And mom, do you want to? Yeah, and we're, what we're going to do in conclusion of our talk is we're going to talk about the seven gifts of the Holy Spirit. Wisdom, understanding, counsel, fortitude, knowledge, piety, fear of God. And then there's also the fruits of the Holy Spirit, which are love, patience, faithfulness, joy, kindness, peace, and goodness, all that the Holy Spirit will bring. 
um, through his intercession and through his power filling us. So, And we just want to thank you all for coming and joining us. And we hope that you learned a few things. And we just want to ask God to bless you all and keep you. So we're going to sign off now. And God bless. Bye. Thank you all. Thank you so much. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.